Good morning. I'm Jim Barriman. I'm here to speak on the uh, model rocket stability. I'm going to talk mostly about uh, the concepts of stability as opposed to the aerodynamic equations. Aerodynamic equations are uh, one of the things that I accomplished during my uh, a career as a model rocketeer and, and uh, aerospace engineer. But uh, most important is the concepts that, that uh, lead up to uh, why they're important. Um, I'd like to ask you if you have any questions to uh, put them on the Q&A tab on the right side of your screen. Uh, I will deal with questions uh, at the end of my talk. The, uh, the concept of uh, model rocket stability is, is a very important part of model rocketry, as it is with many things. Uh, rockets are not the only thing that rely on stability. Uh, cars, boats, uh, many different things uh, are, are stable because of their design and because of how they're actually used. But in the case of rocketry, it's particularly important because a stable rocket is a safe rocket. Uh, and a safe rocket is safe because it's predictable. You know uh, in generally where it's going to go as opposed to having it fly all over the place and, and perhaps hurt somebody. And last but not least, it is a very important because of the, it provides uh, for good performance. I'll talk a little bit about that later, uh, tying the two, uh, both safety and predictability to stability uh, through performance. Stability, of course, is a very basic concept. Uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about that. You, you, uh, uh, you're stable when you return to a neutral position or to your original position when you're disturbed or displaced give you an example. I show it on the uh, charts there, but I also have a bowl with a ball in it. And you can see uh, that, that the ball is stable in the, ball, in the bowl because it rolls inside the bowl, comes back to its original position when I try to disturb it. Now you do that on the outside of the bowl, and that's not so true. That, it, it, it goes off and heaven knows where it might end up, all the way across the room perhaps. So uh, that's an unstable situation. Uh, of course, a, a neutrally stable situation uh, would be a, just a ball rolling on a flat flat surface like your desk. And, it, and assuming your desk is level, it'll, uh, if it, it'll move, but it won't uh, keep moving. It'll move just as far as you uh, displace it. And that's neutrally stable because it, it could uh, end up uh, just staying there as long as you don't move it again. But part of that stability and what I talked about earlier is predictability. You can actually, you know that ball's going to stay in the bowl, but you don't know where the ball's going to go uh, as it rolls off the bottom of the bowl. So it's a, a significantly different situation. Uh, for an unstable device. Now, for a rocket, that means flying in a predictable fashion, following the airflow. Uh, if it gets displaced and it's flying, uh, so it's not facing into the airflow, a stable rocket will move back into the airflow and uh, it may rock a little bit, but it will uh, eventually damp out. And, uh, and go uh, in the direction of the airflow again. And again, uh, that, is a, that is stable. Uh, stability, and a key concept of stability for a rocket. Of course, an unstable rocket could go anywhere. And that's very unsafe. Uh, that's the last thing we want to see in a rocket. And I, uh, I certainly would... Uh, be uh, very unhappy if I had any rockets uh, flying around me that were not uh, predictable and stable. Of course, a neutrally stable rocket means that if it gets displaced relative to the airflow, it just stays there. 
Yeah, you really don't want that either because it tends to wander around. I've seen rockets that were kind of marginally stable or, or neutrally stable, and uh, they, uh, they're they not fun to be around either. I can see that. See what that looks like in a in a, uh, a diagram that I I put together. The uh, stable rocket, of course, flies up and in a, in a direct fashion that I uh, is enjoyable to watch. In fact, and that's why I enjoy rocketry as much as I do. But an unstable rocket, not so much. I would not be. Uh, uh, and I've been around a couple of them, and and uh, I would. Rather not do that again. Neutrally stable, as I say, tends to wander around. Uh, so you can tell by how a rocket uh, flies uh, just how stable it is. But of course, uh, we don't want anybody to be flying a rocket that's not stable. We want to find fly all rockets in a stable, predictable fashion. Now, as we as we talk specifically about rockets, there are two kinds of forces acting on a model rocket and on any rocket. Uh, the translational forces are the forces that uh, uh, result in it actually moving along and, and how determines how high it goes, uh, how far from the pad it might land, that sort of thing. Uh, all of those forces, um, act through the center of gravity of a rocket. Um, many rocket simulations actually view rockets strictly as a as a ball uh, around the center of gravity and and uh, and follow the center of gravity as part of their simulation and don't even uh, know that uh, what the rocket's configuration is made of. It just knows that it has a certain amount of thrust. Uh, it has a certain drag coefficient, and it uh, has a certain amount of weight. And as you can see on the diagram, uh, the weight will shift as the uh, direction of flight goes off the vertical, but it still stays in a predictable direct fashion determined by the thrust and the drag on the rocket. But then there are also... Uh, other kinds of forces that act elsewhere uh, on a rocket. Well, let's talk a little bit more about the center of gravity. The center of gravity is special because, as I said before, the translational forces, the thrust, the weight, the drag, all act through the center of gravity. Now, the center of gravity is where the mass of the rocket is equally distributed on either side, so that's where it balances. Um, I have a uh, something that's not at all a rocket. The first thing I pick up and show you is not at all that, but rather a bathroom brush, a brush that one would use to scrub one's back. But as you can see, it balances uh, somewhere way off the center center uh, of the device, and it's very easy to tip that device around the center of gravity. However, if you try to move it from, say, one end, it's a lot more difficult because it ends up, uh, you have to put a lot more force at the end than you do at the center of gravity to make it rotate. So that's one of the other, that's the other very important thing from the standpoint of rocketry and stability about the center of gravity. That is where a rocket will rotate when it is uh, changing direction. And that's true of any physical object. Center, that next center of gravity is an extremely important part of the uh, equation. So model rockets, by their nature, are aerodynamically stabilized. Now, not everything is, aer not all rockets are aerodynamically stabilized. The rockets we launch satellites with, in fact, are not aerodynamically stable uh, if they did not have a control system on board, which itself was is designed to be stable and control the rocket into its uh, uh, launch path uh, into orbit. It would not. It would uh, 
not fly well. And it would, uh, uh, I've actually seen movies, and some of you, I'm sure, have seen movies of rockets that have not been stable off the launch pad uh, that are trying to launch a satellite or trying to go into space and <clears throat> have had a rather uh, disappointing result. Well, the, uh, but in the case of model rockets and in the case of small rockets in general, like sounding rockets, uh, where I worked for a number of years, uh, sounding, the, uh, a rocket is uh, best as, when it's aerodynamically stable. And the uh, rocket um, aerodynamics are determined by its shape, uh, the fact that it has fins, or it could be, you know, you could envision a rocket that's just one great big cone. As a matter of fact, there have been some uh, anti-aircraft or, or uh, anti-ballistic uh, missile rockets were essentially just big, long cones, uh, as opposed to the normal rocket shape we're used to dealing with. But the, uh, the forces uh, in all cases have been, do act through the uh, center of gravity for the translation. But the rotational forces, that is the forces that make it stable, uh, act elsewhere. They act, uh, since it's aerodynamically stable, through the center of gravity, or through the center of pressure, I'm sorry. And the center of pressure, like the center of gravity, is where all those uh, aerodynamic forces uh, balance out uh, uh, due to the shape of the rocket. And so the center of pressure back here uh, is not the same as the center of gravity. And it, you can change the center of gravity by changing the weight distribution. You can change the center of pressure by changing the shape distribution on the outside of the rocket. So between the two of them, they provide uh, the forces that act on the ro rocket to keep it aerodynamically stable. And that uh, that is very key to the, uh, a key part of that is the angle of attack. Uh, I use the symbol alpha, which is kind of a standard in aerodynamic theory to denote the uh, angle of attack. That is the airflow flowing over the rocket when it's not going down the center line of the rocket. And so the angle between that flow, flow direction and the uh, rocket center line is called the angle of attack. And that <clears throat> that is uh, uh, what we usually talk about when we're talking about the, the motion of a rocket relative to the airflow. And the, uh, uh, there are a number of uh, simulations that, that uh, take that, uh, that airflow and, and the uh, uh, rocket's shape and, and stability into account when they, uh, when they uh, simulate how the rocket will fly. Uh, some of them, uh, any rocket has three degrees of freedom to rotate and translate. You have three uh, degrees of freedom in space. You also have three degrees of freedom of rotation. You have spin, you have yaw, and you have pitch, all three rotational degrees of freedom. We typically talk about uh, stability, though, in a, in a single or two, in two dimensions uh, for simplicity. But in, in, uh, for a, uh, a rocket like we tend to fly, which are uh, pretty rotationally uh, uh, symmetric. It really doesn't matter. You, you deal with it as a as a uh, in two dimensions rather than uh, or in th two one uh, two ro two uh, translation on one rotational degree of freedom usually provides you with enough information to do uh, to do a good job of understanding the rocket. Now. That center of gravity versus the center of pressure, uh, since they're acting in two different, in, in two, it rotates easily about the center of gravity. Its motion is through the, is by the center of gravity, but its rotation is now being influenced and, and affected 
by the normal forces, the summation of all the normal forces acting at the center of pressure. And that moment arm between the center of gravity and the center of pressure, which is called a lot of the uh, static margin, um, is the uh, indication of, of the kind of stability the rocket's going to see and the kind of moment that is going to uh, restore the rocket back into flying in the direction of the, of the uh, uh, air moving across the rocket. So it's, it's important to understand what that, what that angle of attack is, uh, what the shape of the rocket is, and how that moment will affect the rocket and its stability. So the aerodynamic moment um, will, <clears throat> will determine very, be determined very much by the relative position of the center of gravity and the center of pressure. That's why we are so concerned about uh, both of those when we're dealing with rocket stability. In a st stable rocket, as everybody has learned for uh, since they started building them, you want the center of pressure behind the center of gravity that is further away from the nose and closer to the tail. But a rocket that's unstable, you can see that the moment is pushing it back into the airflow. But if the uh, center of pressure were ahead of the center of gravity, the normal forces acting on the rocket would be further pushing it away from the flow. And oh my gosh, who knows where it's gonna go? Cause it's, it's uh, not going to be acting in a very, safe or predictable fashion. And certainly we want to, we want to avoid that. The, uh, the one thing that, that uh, I, uh, I wanna, want you to understand moments is a little bit different than, than just plain forces, but we use moments all the time. Um, when you're turning a doorknob, you're applying a moment to that doorknob. When you're, uh, I'm capping a, uh, a soda bottle. You're applying a moment to that, to that soda bottle's uh, cap. It's not an unusual thing. It's no, moments are everywhere. And, uh, it's not something to be, uh, mystified about. It's, uh, it's part of, uh, uh, the dynamics of anything that we deal with. Uh, and most of the, most of the time we deal with it without even considering it. Now we do want to be stable. Uh, we we uh, we don't uh, we don't just want to be concerned about the uh, uh, the fact that it's that it's safe. We also want our rockets to perform well. And one of the things you need to be concerned about in in dealing with the uh, uh, center of pressure and the center of gravity is you don't want too much stability. Uh, too much stability can adversely affect your performance. Yes, it will fly up. Uh, it will fly in a predictable fashion. But if it's too stable, it's going to be too easily affected by other things like the wind. And as soon as it leaves the launch rod, it's going to start arcing over earlier than you'd really want it to. You want it, certainly, you'd like it to fly straight up. You'd like it to fly in a fashion that provides uh, provides you with uh, the maximum altitude or the maximum duration uh, so that you get the best performance out of your rocket. A too stable rocket, well, uh, when it arches over because it's too stable, uh, will not go as high as a, a, a rocket that's adequately stable. And of course, the, the Rule of thumb these days has been to uh, keep your center of gravity and center of pressure within one uh, one diameter one of the uh, of the rocket body itself. Now I know rocket bodies can have a lot of different diameters. Uh, you can kind of pick it uh, depending on what you're uh, doing with the rock, what kind of rocket you're building. I would uh, I would say that a uh, uh, you'd want to be, uh, uh, yeah, probably the average diameter of the rocket would be the good r rule of thumb. But, you know, it could be a little bit less than that, probably, uh, a little bit more. It's not that exact. 
It's something that you just want to keep it close uh, so that it's uh, reasonably set up to uh, provide a, a stable flight that is not too responsive to the winds when you uh, when you work the uh, uh, when you are flying in a windy situation. Now there are lots of ways to determine whether your rocket's stable or not. If it's already been bu been built, the best way is to use uh, before you fly it, of course, to use a swing test. That is, you uh, tie a string around the uh, uh, center of gravity tightly, and then swing it. Uh, and there's a the handbook of model rocketry has. Uh, information about how to do a swing test. Many of us have done swing tests that are really pretty easy, but you want to do them outside. Uh, do them in a place where you're not going to be uh, running into anything with your rocket. And um, of course, uh, it, it really doesn't help to do a swing test. You can't do a swing test on a rocket that you haven't actually built. So it, it's only good for those rockets that you've already built. And if for some reason you haven't uh, uh, done any analysis on it to see whether or not it's going to be stable, then that's the best way to determine that it is stable, even though you haven't uh, determined that ahead of time. You would really like to do that. And for designs that you haven't actually built yet, um, first thing you need to do, of course, is to determine that the center of gravity, uh, center of gravity of the rocket, um, Theoretically and, and by calculation is basically a case of, of determining the center of gravity of all the components of the rocket, the engine, the nose cone, the fins, parachute, and uh, body tube. And then uh, determining each of those center of gravities. The center of gravity of, uh, uh, is often provided by the manufacturer of individual items or you can determine the center of gravity of a of a, a shape like a fin by uh, making a, a, a cardboard cutout of it and then uh, balancing it to determine what its what its center of gravity is. For nose, most nose cones, uh, you could balance it on a finger or with a string. Uh, there's a lot of ways to determine centers of gravity for uh, these different components. Of course, a, a parachute, once you wad it up, and, and you can kind of figure it's kind of in the middle of that wad. But uh, then you do, you do an analysis, do a, uh, by doing moment, adding up the moments of those uh, various things from, say, the nose of the rocket, uh, you can then determine the center of gravity. It's fairly straightforward, and, and uh, uh, I know the uh, Handbook of Model Rocketry has, uh, information on doing that job, as well as uh, lots of other uh, pla places on the internet. The center of pressure, there's two basic methods to deal with center of pressure determination for, for anybody who has not yet built a rocket. Uh, the cardboard cutout method is uh, an interesting way to do it, and it was used for many years. Uh, and it basically determines the center of pressure of a rocket when it's flying at 90 degrees. And yes, in fact, the uh, uh, center of pressure will change with angle of attack. Uh, at higher angles of attack, uh, the uh, center of pressure uh, will move around quite a bit. The, uh, that's one of the reasons we like to keep our rockets flying pretty, uh, pretty small angles of attack, if at all possible. Uh, interestingly, rockets that are meant for like uh, anti-aircraft use in military, uh, try to minimize the, the uh, static margin, minimize the distance between the center of pressure and CG, um, so that they can take advantage of the fact that they don't have a whole lot of stability when they're trying to guide the rocket, uh, and aim it at, and actually, uh, um, control the rocket, uh, that acts uh, that's going after a uh, an aircraft or what have you, but the uh, but the 
the thing to remember is that, that using the uh, uh, cardboard cutout method gives you a very conservative, that is a much larger uh, uh, stability measure than you would actually see at zero uh, or near zero angle of attack. And, and the, it was because of that that, that uh, I first started uh, decided to try and use some of the techniques that we use for sounding rockets when I was working for NASA to apply them to uh, uh, model rockets. Uh, they're basically, they are both uh, aerodynamically stabilized as a rule, and they provide, uh, and uh, as many of our scale modelers know, uh, they sure look a lot like our, our model rockets. So why not use the same uh, equations that we use to an, analyze those uh, sounding rockets to analyze model rockets as well? Uh, I, I actually spent some time uh, uh, creating model, uh, sounding rocket analysis programs to determine the uh, stability of sounding rockets. And I thought I could use those very same things. But the trouble is, is that those, uh, those require a lot of computer capability. They required a lot of uh, um, fairly uh, sophisticated mathematics. Uh, but it turns out that uh, with using some simplifying assumptions to uh, uh, go to apply those to model rockets, you could actually do that. And uh, we have uh, we're able to simplify the the uh, very complex equations uh, that the uh, and that allowed us to. Uh, uh, have the, uh, those same equations in simplified form available for model rockets. Uh, uh, I look a lot different today than I did uh, way back when I was working on uh, sounding rockets, um, but uh, I would still love to have rockets around me all the time. It's a it's a enjoyable hobby and a, and was an enjoyable. Uh, uh, job to have uh, working with sounding rockets and, and not just uh, analyzing them, but uh, getting them ready in the field and actually flying them. Um, it was, uh, and it's something I uh, I still enjoy today. But the, uh, the initial uh, work was done for sounding rockets, uh, but since they're both there dynamically stabilized and since they're, uh, the same aerodynamic principles apply. We could apply the same aerodynamic research and engineering that was done uh, back in the early days of, of uh, rocketry and, uh, and, and put them to use on model rocket. Uh, the assumptions that I made though um, are, are very interesting from the standpoint of how they affect and, and how well they apply to a particular rocket. Um, you look at a, a, a rocket as a rigid body, that is rockets tend to be very stiff. Uh, they're, they're, uh, uh, unless you do a lousy job of uh, uh, sanding down the nose cone and the, and the uh, hooking it into the uh, body, uh, or do a lousy job of uh, putting the uh, fins on. Uh, as a rule, they're are pretty rigid. Of course, uh, I keep when I look at some of these super rocket, uh, super rock models around uh, these things that are uh, you know uh, yards long and only uh, uh, inches in diameter. Uh, I begin to wonder whether or not they uh, are really rigid bodies, but. Uh, so you have to be careful in applying these the aerodynamic equations to some uh, design like that. Actually, symmetric is pretty easy to to maintain. Um, although uh, all of our rockets have you know launch lugs and things like that that kind of stick out on them uh, that are not symmetric, but they're typically very small, so it really doesn't matter that much. Uh, 
the flow over the rocket is potential flow. That is that it's smooth. Basically means it's smooth flow. Uh, and as a rule, that's that's a really good uh, uh, assumption on our rockets. Um, it, it was necessary, it's necessary that it be that way or else we couldn't really uh, analyze our rockets at all. Um, obviously, uh, there are a few rockets around that have people build with flat noses and, and uh, uh, the, the equations are not as, as uh, accurate for them as it would be for uh, a rocket whose nose comes to a point like a, a you know, jive rocket like this one, or a uh, uh, one with a conical nose like this one. They uh, these all uh, basically come to a point, and they uh, and that that provides a uh, smooth flow over the rocket. Part of the problem with a flat nose or or very blunt nose is that they, they tend to get turbulent flow. And that that can uh, cause instabilities. Uh, even so, it, it, you can get pretty close with the equations, but you have to provide more static margin, more distance between your uh, center of gravity and your center of pressure in order to compensate for that. But you can still you can still get away with with uh, uh, dealing with uh, uh, rockets that are not perfectly uh, always have the same kind of ogive cone or elliptical or or uh, circular or spherical on those cones. Um, I've actually done some analysis on uh, elliptical nose cones and on uh, uh, parabolic nose cones. And, and uh, uh, they, uh, I think they were model rocket model rocketeer articles that gave the results of those analyses that uh, show the uh, uh, what the uh, uh, center of pressure is on nose cones of that nature. Um, fins, of course, are thin, flat plates with no cant. Now, it really doesn't matter that a fin has cant to it as long as the fin all the fins on a rocket are canted equally. So you get a smooth spin. Uh, if you start getting into uh, uh, situations where the, the uh, rocket is spinning because you have canted fins, uh, you can get into dynamics instabilities because the uh, if the uh, uh, spin rate of a rocket gets close to its pitch rate, that is the the tendency of it to the uh, rate at which the rocket uh, uh, pitches back and forth in the flow rate um, gets very close to the spin rate. A rocket can go unstable dynamically, even though it's uh, statically stable with the CP behind the CG, with the center of pressure behind the center of gravity. All this is good. Uh, the, these equations are good into a very low angle of attack of up to around 10, maybe even a little bit more, maybe 15 degrees. But once you get it beyond that, then things start, uh, turbulence comes into play. Uh, certainly your, uh, your ability to uh, uh, keep it near a, near a zero angle of attack uh, makes, it, uh, makes it, it becomes very difficult. So uh, we, we uh, we try to fly our, our birds near a zero angle of attack, and and the equations work real well up to say 10, 15 degrees. The flow is steady state. That's kind of the same as potential flow. That is, uh, it's not just taking off. That's one of the reasons we use launch rods, uh, so we can fly a rocket as it as it comes up to speed. It's being uh, stabilized by the launch rod. And then it, once it's at steady state and it leaves the launch rod, it's in much better shape uh, to uh, be aerodynamically stabilized. Last but not certainly not least, the flow is subsonic. Now, believe me, uh, to beat that uh, uh, subsonic flow rate uh, assumption is very hard. 
uh, for a model rocket. Not so much for a sounding rocket. They fly uh, supersonically, in some cases hypersonically, uh, on a regular basis, uh, especially as they leave the atmosphere. Uh, and uh, the, one of the big differences between the sounding rocket equations and the model rocket equations is that the sounding rocket equations uh, can be applied throughout its flight path, and even though it is can be uh, supersonic, and, and that uh, that's why there's a lot of uh, <clears throat> a lot of computer uh, uh, based analyses for sounding rockets that we don't even need to use for for model rockets. Although uh, the model rocket to model rocketry uh, has become quite sophisticated, and there are lots of uh, uh, programs around for for uh, uh, understanding uh, stability and and flight path, uh, even though it's all subsonic. Now, in the, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the equations associated with uh, the uh, with calculating the center of pressure. Uh, it was something I spent a lot of time on in, in, uh, uh, in trying to pull it together for the, uh, for the model rocketry. It was a, uh, I actually did a, uh, uh, an R&D subject, a uh, project with my wife, Judy, uh, who uh, uh, was very helpful. Uh, we we uh, actually presented it at NARIM-8. Uh, as a uh, R and D program, as an R and D uh, uh, project, the um, the project, uh, the notebook, the original notebook that uh, was presented at NRM8 has since uh, been put into the uh, uh, National Association of Rocketry um, exhibits in the Museum of Flight out in uh, Oregon, so um, in Washington. I'm sorry, in Seattle, Washington. So it's uh, uh, it's still available for people who'd like to look at the very original uh, uh, R&D project that uh, went into this. But when you're doing that kind of a project, and of course it's all mathematics, you can see here uh, uh, the, uh, using uh, uh, integral calculus uh, and uh, uh, turning that, using that to derive. Uh, geometric equations and, and uh, uh, regular uh, normal uh, equations that, that we use in, in, uh, in analyzing the rocket so that it becomes fairly straightforward to apply the, the uh, geometry information uh, in fairly straightforward equations. If you look at the nose center of pressure, just as an example, um, the uh, center of pressure on the nose, as you derive it, uh, turns out to be nothing more than the length of the nose, of the nose cone. If you look at a, at a, uh, a nose cone like this ogive, uh, the, the uh, nose cone is uh, just this much of the rocket, so the back on uh, two, about two, a little less than halfway back. Um, is about the, where the center of pressure is, about 0.466. And that comes from the volume of the rocket divided by the base area, or the volume of the nose cone divided by the base area of the nose cone. It's that simple, the volume divided by the base area. And that, that was a really great result. Um, however, we look at, we, again, we look at this, at this ogive, okay, what is an ogive shape? This, that's, it's a shape we've all seen. We have all used ogive nose cones on our rockets at some point. Uh, a small rocket is the same way as a small ogive. Uh, but what is, what is that shape? What did that shape really come from? Well, it is actually a segment or a, uh, a section of a circle. If you uh, if you take the sec section of a circle, you just chop off the top of the circle, and then and then rotate that chopped off piece. Uh, that becomes an ogive. So it's so the the base of the ogive is 
is on a radius of the circle, and then the arc of the circle down to uh, however the the uh, half the radius of the nose cone uh, defines the ogive shape, and then you rotate that around the center center lines. So that's a fairly simple shape. You would think that that would be like a cone. Um, you know, for a Jojive, I said it's like 0.466, but how did I get that number? I'll show you in a minute. But for a cone, uh, it's it's uh, even simpler. It's about uh, two thirds of a of a. Uh, uh, let's see, for a cone, it's yeah, two thirds of the length. Uh, for a parabola, it's about half the length. So the uh, uh, those numbers are fairly straightforward. Interestingly, for a uh, uh, nose uh, normal force, that is the, the force that actually is exerted on the nose, um, the coefficient associated with it is is two, uh, it, and that's a, a derived number, and it and it's true for all actually symmetric uh, nose cones that all nose cones have the same normal force coefficient of two. And so uh, using the first equation on the page, you can see that you can come up with the uh, uh, dividing the, that into the moment uh, gives you the uh, uh, volume divided by the base area. So what happens when you apply that to an ogive? Well, here's the tangent ogive center of pressure equation. Now, if you look at that, that's a, that's a monster, um, and that's not something that that your friend uh, I would like to use on a regular basis if I didn't have a computer in front of me. Um, and the, in this case, F is the is the uh, uh, length divided by the the base diameter. So the length of the diameter, the fineness ratio of the ogive, is the uh, determining factor of the uh, the location of the center of gravity divided by the base diameter of the of the ogive. But you put that into a computer, and by the way, you you can use a computer to solve that equation, but you've got to be careful. If you notice that equation, is a number of terms. It includes a number of different terms that are added together. And guess what? In order to add those together accurately or precisely, you need a lot of significant figures. It turns out that you need on the order of nine or 10 significant figures because there's a lot of zeros ahead of the significant figures in all those individual terms uh, when you when you go to actually evaluate all of them. But I did that. I made a, a, a program, and then I plotted the result. And oh boy, look what happened. Well, that, a no-jive nose cone center of pressure is a very simple, linear, as it turns out, uh, function. Uh, when you apply this very weird and, and convoluted uh, expression. And where it starts to come apart is way down, way down at the uh, very bottom, very near the origin, very close to the uh, zero point, uh, where it turns into a sphere and then, and then just uh, disappears as it becomes a hemisphere. So it is... Uh, it was very fortunate that this very complicated equation turns as you get into the side, the size of the uh, equations that we normally use, that is uh, the size of nose cones we normally use, that is nose cones that are two or three or four uh, uh, times the length of their, or five times the length of their diameter. It works out very well, thank heavens. And uh, cones and, and uh, parabolas actually turned out to be much simpler. Uh, but uh, this one was a toughie. And uh, fortunately, it, it was not a showstopper. Now, just to give you an idea, uh, of course, uh, 
I made sure that this was a, uh, a valid thing. I went into uh, uh, wind tunnel data and compared uh, the analyses that I did on, on rockets uh, to wind tunnel data. Uh, I also test flight a lot of rockets uh, to make sure that they were uh, were valid. I, I flew a couple of rockets uh, at NARAM-8 uh, to show uh, the judges that they were, uh, in fact, stable, even though they, uh, uh, when I showed them where the center of pressure was that I had calculated versus the center of gravity, uh, they actually were a, a little uh, uh, unsure that I was going to have a stable rocket. But it turned out, yep, by golly, they, uh, they were, or I wouldn't have flown them, of course. They were stable. Uh, so since then, over the last 50 years, uh, there have been lots and lots of rockets flown that have been uh, uh, analyzed using these equations, um, and and they have all gotten good performance, good uh, safe flights. So the so the bottom line, I come back to it: Are you stable? You want to be stable because it's safe. You want to be stable because it's predictable. You know that it's going to fly in a, in a uh, predictable fashion, uh, and you're going to get good performance out of a safe, stable rocket. But you want to know it before you fly it, so you need to do the do the analysis. As a minimum, do the do the uh, uh, Cardboard cutout method, but uh, there are lots of uh, ways you can access the uh, uh, the equations that that were derived for model rockets. Uh, the best the best place to get it is the uh, uh, right at the uh, handbook of model rocketry by G. Harry Stein, which is available through the NAR. Uh, the the two uh, uh, Major uh, simulation programs available, RockSim and uh, in Simple Rocket, are uh, uh, are available. Have it built in. Uh, there are a lot of uh, uh, websites that have either the uh, the original uh, uh, books that were written about the um, uh, stability and the equations, or they have the equations themselves right there in the websites. And you can get them that way. Uh, and I highly recommend you uh, you try using them. Uh, and if you have any problems with them, uh, I I can only say that that it's uh, it's simple geometry. It's a ca case of uh, uh, putting your putting the uh, shapes that you have on your rocket into the uh, into the shapes that, that are necessary for analysis by these equations. So, uh, in, in my mind, the, the uh, uh, I got them down as simple as they could be, and uh, to simplify them any further is would be a very iffy thing. But there, uh, you could use a calculator and do the job without a computer. Uh, you could use a slide rule. You could use a pencil and paper and do them, but. Uh, Sure is a lot easier when you have a, a simulation or a computer program that will do them for you. So with that, I, uh, I'll uh, proceed to talk, uh, answer some of the questions that have shown up, and uh, let me uh, let me take a look at those and and see what uh, see what I need to say. Uh, see, I'll start. I guess at the very first one. Um, can you talk about the drag and why short stubby rockets seem unstable via sim programs, but they actually are very stable? Well, base drag is, is a whole different topic. And uh, uh, the, the instability, the stability of short, very short rockets um, is, is almost as if he is for very long rockets in my mind, because you're dealing with very small uh, differentials uh, in the in the uh, CP and CG, and so if you're uh, you've got to be very accurate 
uh, in doing your analysis of those answers. So in, in my mind, and I'll, I'll uh, type out answers to everybody, but I'm going to give them to you over the over the uh, the talk here. In my mind, they're probably stable because they, the uh, rocket's de design is right. Uh, you know, a short study uh, covers a lot of ground, but as far as I'm concerned, it, the shorter they are, uh, the smaller that's, that uh, uh, static margin is between the center of pressure and the center of uh, gravity. And <clears throat> so they, as far as I'm concerned, I'm not, I'm not sure what the base drag has to do with it, because the base drag is not a normal force on the uh, on the rocket and it's really just a question of the fact that they're very short compared to their diameter and uh, they're mostly a rocket like that ends up also having uh, mostly fin so how do you not make it stable um, Chris Schletter uh, is asking, by the way, this that was a question from uh, Steve Navard. Uh, Chris Schletter asked the question, have you ported the original equations to modern computing hardware? Um, I have uh, on, uh, on just a regular, uh, uh, center, uh, regular PC, uh, but I haven't used it uh, recently. Uh, because I just use uh, RockSim or I use uh, 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 the uh, Open Rocket, uh, which have them built in. So I just use those those, uh, and, that, and it's the, that's the easiest way to to uh, uh, access them and, and uh, uh, have all the uh, performance uh, calculations done as well. Okay. Uh, in, uh, Mark McReynolds is asking, in particular, is there a need to plot to a plot of model length versus diameter versus calculated CPR? Rule of thumb, L over D value below which accuracy of the CP calculated by this method greatly decreases for a conventional layout model. Um, not really, not really. Um, I would say that the uh, uh, the rule of thumb applies pretty much at all scales. Again, the the, uh, the thing that you got to watch out for is a length of a, di a long rocket relative to its diameter is no longer can really can be considered to be uh, a rigid body. And if it's not a rigid body, then then uh, the the equations really don't apply. But again, you can make it stiff enough, or you can you can compensate. Uh, but I, it's hard for a long rocket to be unstable as long as you put uh, uh, put any fins at all on the bottom, because as it goes to a higher angle of attack, even as it as it uh, uh, bends and and isn't rigid. Uh, the body the body comes into play as a uh, uh, basically as a stick rocket, where the body is really really uh, uh, providing a lot of the stability. You know you can fly rockets without fins if they're long enough, because the, the but it's uh, they're all over the place and that, and it's not really recommended. But no, there's no particular need. Or no particular uh, place where uh, things don't apply. The need for a, uh, a rule of thumb uh, a static margin of one one diameter uh, would not apply. Um, can you relate any cool story that comes to mind about rocket flight failure? From a, well. Um, Somewhere on the uh, internet, there's probably a, uh, a very cool uh, 
very cool film, very cool uh, video clip uh, the, the rocket that was unstable right off the launch pad simply because it's, uh, uh, it, it had a, a, a burn through on the side of the rocket, uh, rocket motor and it caused it, that rocket to just flip all over the place and scare the heck out of everybody right on. And it was flopping around on the launch pad and never even got into the air. Uh, that was a scary, uh, scary rocket, and it was uh, one I'd never want to see again. Uh, but there are films of it uh, available. I know uh, at one time uh, the Narhams had a copy of it. I'm not sure. I, I lost my copy a number of years ago. Uh, it may be in, buried somewhere in my basement, but I, I can't put my finger on it right now. But they, there have been uh, occasions where things really uh, get out of hand. So it's a uh, it's a, it's the kind of thing that that uh, when it, instability is not a, a pleasant thing, but it can be exciting. Uh, let's see. Again, uh, um, hmm. I'm losing track of of some of these. Uh, as other ones come in past the, the ones that I already answered. Bear with me. Um, bear with me. I can't. I'm trying to keep. Uh, is it possible to replace the fins with a kind of this is Col Joe Colismo, Col Colismo, um, with a conical tail flare? I've done that. Um, and it's, uh, it works fine. The problem is, is that that, that uh, conical, uh, flare, uh, provides a lot of drag as well, but it works fine. I've, I've uh, built rockets that, that uh, use a conical flare tail, and they, they work fine. Um, so Roxim, in using, uh, Phil Newble is asking, in, in using Roxim, CP can be calculated using your equations. Or the Roxim equations, and they don't agree. I, I, uh, I haven't seen that, um, so I'm not sure I understand what you're saying. The Roxim equations are, as far as I know, are my equations. So I'm, I'm not sure I understand why that's happening, Phil. That's Phil Nubel. Um, is there mathematical support for the one caliber stability criteria? Actually, not. Um, the, the you're talking about margin. You're talking about something how how much uh, how much of a uh, a risk you're willing to take with your stability, and that's all it really uh, boils down to. As I said, the larger the stability, the more sensitive it's going to be to the wind. The less stability, the more likely is it could go unstable. Either because you didn't calculate things right, uh, one of the either the, your CP or CG is off, or because you, the uh, uh, there is something else wrong, different about your rocket that that wasn't taken into account. So it's good to have that margin, and the one one uh, one diameter uh, criterion. Seems to work pretty well there, but there's no real basis for it. Um, is there any way to account, Tom Galloway, is there any way to account for 24 millimeter tube fins at the ends of trapezoidal shaped one eighth inch? Ah, uh, not really. No, um, I did do an analysis of pods on the uh, pods that used uh, 
uh, ogive uh, nose and and uh, a no jive nose and an ogive at the back of the pod. I did do analysis of that, Tom, and um, uh, I'll see, and it, I'll have to look it up the uh, result, but it it uh, it's pretty straightforward. You could do the analysis yourself if, just by putting putting in an ogive nose on a on a uh, uh, on a body tube and and using that as as a uh, a means of of uh, calculating what a uh, uh, to uh, something on the end of a fin would do. Let's see if I can uh, thrust. Uh, let's see, Jacob of Alpha Omega Rocketry, have you studied? Thrust vector control. Have you done any work in that field of aerospace? Actually, we had a, a sounding rocket that did that, um, and it was um, it is the airy sounding rocket that actually uses thrust vector control, uh, and that's it used it not the not for stability but for management of the, it's keeping the rocket on a very small range. We actually flew. Uh, the uh, Ares rocket up in uh, uh, northern Sweden, right near, um, well, right near the right near Russia, in fact. And so we were one to be very careful about keeping that bird on range. And uh, although we had a, a major catastrophe up there along the way, it wasn't due to the the uh, uh, stability of the rocket. It, it actually uh, was too light. And, the, and it burned through uh, just before it burned out. Uh, let's see. How, uh, how does one deal with a bulbous nose cone such as the Honest John? Again, uh, that's, a, uh, that's a no jive with a, uh, with a cone at the back end. Uh, you just break it down into its components. This is Brian Horuk. Uh, Jim Filler, uh, Jim, uh, no question. Just wanted to say thanks. Well, thanks. Uh, Gary Crowell, do you ever use VCP uh, pre rock sim? Uh, never did. No, I had my own, uh, when I was working at NASA, I made my own computer programs. Um, uh, now there, the pro, there, are, there are a number of programs like rock sim and others that. Are are better than than anything else I've ever used. Um, Zeke, would a bent rocket tube mean bent flight? Probably, or or very uh, floppy flight, or very uh, 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 spiraling flight. But uh, uh, I wouldn't uh, I wouldn't want to do fly my bird if I I knew it was bent, unless I was trying to do something funny. Uh, but you still would want to try and make it as stable as possible. Um, is there a way, since you talk, this is Bob Morstadt, since you talked about the CP of nose cone, is there a way CPs of components are added together to get the overall CP? Yeah, that's exactly what you do. Um, and again, I, I refer you to the handbook of model rocketry that has the entire set of the equations, which shows how to combine your uh, center of pressure calculations into the entire rocket. Um, there are um, online also the original uh, Century uh, books that I wrote or, or pamphlets that I wrote about uh, center of pressure and stability are usually available online. Just I would recommend you just uh, um, uh, Google uh, center of pressure, for example. Okay. Uh, thanks, Brian. Yeah, the questions come in from the bottom up. Yeah, and they were there. I think I've got through all of them. Uh, calculation of stability of rockets without fins. Uh, as I said, Richard Rakoff. Uh, uh, you can. What you're doing is you're trying to fly a rocket that's going to 
is going to uh, uh, spiral and fly very wide angles of attack. And that's, uh, that's doable, but not desirable, I don't think. So I think I've answered all the questions. And I will, uh, I will try and type up answers and send them, send them back out as well. Uh, that's all, folks. Thanks for listening.